Hi everyone, my name's Amy Frearson. I'm editor-at-large at Dezine and we're broadcasting live from Dezine Studio Space in London. Today we're teaming up with Mad Architects to discuss Blueprint Beijing, the architecture exhibition that forms part of the inaugural Beijing Biennial. We'll be exploring the topics within the exhibition and looking to the future of Beijing and its architecture. And we have some very special guests joining us on the panel. First up is my first up is Mai Yan Song, founder of Mad and curator of Blueprint Beijing. Uh, hi, Mark. Give everyone a wave. And we've also got legendary architect Sir Peter Cook, who is chairman of the Cook Hefner Architecture Platform, and who famously founded Archigram in 1960. Hi, Peter. Give the audience Hello. a wave. Good morning. And, uh, and finally, we have Li Han and Hu Yan, co-founders of Drawing Architecture Studio. Um, can you both also give the audience a wave? Yes. Hi, everyone. Hello, this is Li Han. I'm Hu Yan. Great. And I'm going to hand over to Ma Yansong, uh, who's going to introduce the exhibition. And um, please, please go ahead. Hello from Beijing. Uh, after this uh, pandemic, we were doing a very unique show in Beijing. It's about architecture and the visionary uh, future uh, of the city of Beijing. And for this exhibition, we uh, invite a lot of great uh, architects from all over the world, um, from different uh, generations. And uh, the name of the show uh, is called the Blueprint uh, Beijing. I'm going to share uh, some images of the show so you can have a very, very quick uh, impression. So Blueprint, we all know it's a, it's a tool for architects to, to make drawings, to, to turn your imagination into reality. But here we want to give a new definition. We want to uh, show the architects has a has a very uh, uh, daring vision uh, for the city. It's very futuristic or visionary. Uh, so those are our architects we included uh, in the show. It's not big list, uh, but we want to uh, uh, to 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 have this dialogue between Chinese young architects and international uh, architects uh, and uh, have this discussion about the future uh, vision uh, for Beijing. We also include some uh, documentary uh, uh, in this show because we want to show the spirit from uh, previous generations. Uh, so uh, they they work uh, we we studied in the school and uh, and uh, when we were uh, young architects and, and uh, we want to uh, show the proof that uh, the great vision will will uh, result uh, a, a very uh, a very uh, 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 thoughtful uh, 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 research in the architecture and I'm showing some uh, pictures in the in the in this show. Um, so here you see some models and uh, and the posters. This is a very interesting poster. We show a timeline uh, of the city of Beijing uh, from 1945 uh, uh, to now. And in this timeline, we showed uh, two history parallel. One is a, a global uh, architectural history and and. Uh, and another one is uh, is what what happened in our city. And this is a, a, a one a research project uh, on the ceiling and the floor uh, by Wang Zigong, a, a very young Chinese uh, architect and, and the researcher. And on the background is the early uh, print uh, by Zaha Hadid. They're very abstract paintings about cities and architecture. And we're also showing Eric Owen Moss, uh, the new city, a model from Los Angeles, the cover city he's uh, practicing uh, in. Uh, open Architecture is a studio based in Beijing. 
uh, led it by Li Hu. Uh, and uh, and uh, we are showing this uh, research project about the ring road of the city. And they have the idea to turn this uh, um, a traffic road into um, a, a, a loop park in the future. We also showed this uh, a model, uh, but you can also call this a uh, one-to-one scale uh, bookshelf uh, by Yong He Chang. Um, uh, uh, his idea is about the, the bicycle in the, in the traditional way, how, how people travel in, in Beijing. And, and he, he also shows the architecture conceptual models on this uh, um, bookshelf. You know, this also this is showing some uh, other uh, conceptual models. And <clears throat> this is uh, another uh, space. We, we compose the space by different uh, installations and architecture uh, models. And here in the, in the forefront, you can see uh, this uh, uh, restaurant behind the wall, right? Is it uh, created by Drawing Architecture Studio? Uh, later on, I will explain. On the background, you see a hanging, uh, hanging installation by uh, uh, Toyo Ito. Uh, uh, it's a, a dwelling for a Tokyo nomad woman, second version. It's, a, it's a, like a temporary house for an uh, individual. And the background, very colorful, very uh, <laughs> a beautiful image by Peter Cook. And uh, it's very, uh, interactive. I would say a lot, a lot of people come to 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 wandering around uh, in these three dimensional pictures, images. And here you see um, uh, a model produced by Mad Architects. It's a um, it's a traditional part of Beijing city uh, around Gulou area. You see a lot of uh, hutong and the courtyard houses. And also, uh, we made this uh, blue bubbles you see in this context. We call them um, hutong bubbles. They're actually a toilet uh, for those uh, residents because they don't have a private toilet. They have to go to the public toilet. So the, 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 the project was about to providing um, uh, the, uh, the modern functions for traditional houses. This is also a um, um, big installation from Warpix. Um, it, it's actually created uh, from very early work. So, but we want to, to, to show this. I, I think it's interesting to see the, uh, the futuristic uh, version from the past. Um, People's Architecture Office. Uh, it's a very interesting research-based uh, young architects group from Beijing, and they're making a lot of uh, interactive installations from very basic uh, materials or architecture elements from the city. The Endless Tower is a lighting installation from uh, Liangchen. Liangchen? Uh, Junya Ishigami, uh, this uh, house and the restaurant uh, in the earth, we show the models and uh, and Mardivi, uh, it's, a, it's a research pro project about Grand Paris. Uh, the, the common, a lot of common issues we have in the city of Beijing as well, because we have a, also a traditional part of the city also, building a lot of a new uh, uh, houses the providing the density for the uh, for the future uh, residents residents we also show some documentary from the past uh, uh, the the visionary images models pictures uh, this is uh, some drawing from archigram also super studio 
uh, Oscar Niemeyer. I like this. Uh, it's a hand drawing. Uh, it's a sketch um, uh, to show very romantic and natural inspiration uh, for those generations. And we also show some movies uh, uh, because it, it's very surprising that uh, actually in different time, uh, we, there, there, there are different uh, um, definition about the future or, or visionary, right? Like uh, they're very interesting short uh, film um, and the stories in, in, the, in the modern history of China. So we sh also show them. Uh, here's a Wei Studio, another young architects uh, group. Also, um, uh, Chen Yanchun, it's a, it's a, uh, they, they propose this a super uh, domino for the, for the city of Beijing. It's, a, it's a, like a, a bookshelf in, in, in the city structure and uh, they can put the new houses in there. We also uh, ask each uh, exhibitors uh, about their vision about Beijing, what they think about the future of Beijing. So later on, maybe we can uh, talk about the, those topics. Okay, that's the brief introduction. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Ma. Um, the exhibition looks absolutely fascinating, and I'm really sad not to have had an opportunity to see it in person. Um, and Mara, as I understand, it's your first time curating an exhibition and to do one at such a grand scale must have been an incredible challenge. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about, I guess, you know, when you were first invited to sort of take on this exhibition, what led you to kind of take on this approach? I mean, looking sort of really at the future and kind of these kind of radical ideas. Yeah, that's my first time being a curator and, uh, and uh, the invitation came uh, still in, in, in the pandemic uh, period. So it was a little, uh, depressing at that moment. So uh, I, I think it's always excited to to talk about the future, and uh, I was I was thinking maybe this is a good moment of also for uh, China for Beijing uh, talk about the future of the city as well because Beijing is uh, everyone knows it's it's a city with a long history and uh, and uh, in the architecture scene in China people often struggle. Uh, with this, like uh, we have a long history, we have a, a, the, uh, the, uh, the traditional values for architecture and the cities, how we bring these values into the future. So I think this, this discussion is very valuable now. Uh, so the, 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 the exhibition wants to open this discussion um, in, in between Chinese architects, uh, the architects uh, from Beijing and the international architects who uh, uh, with a, all different diverse uh, backgrounds. Uh, what, what's also unique in this exhibition is the, the, the we include people from all different uh, uh, locations and, and different uh, generations. So I, I hope you know, in this moment, the, uh, the heroes, uh, the great architects from the past like uh, Peter Cook, they can bring some inspirations for our young um, architects. Mm -hmm. And this probably seems like a good moment actually to hand over to Peter so him to talk a little bit about a bit, bit more about uh, what he's presenting in the exhibition. Peter, are you, uh, are you ready to go ahead? Yes, indeed. Just getting the picture up. So most of what I'm showing is drawings. I'm one of those people who did a lot of drawing and talking and teaching before I started building. And then I've had a patch of doing buildings, but I find, and, and now I'm working on buildable projects, which I, many of which are in, in Saudi Arabia, so I can't talk about them. I sign frightening documents that tell me not to talk about them, but I sort of, I'll get around that somehow. And I'm, I think that, that for me, therefore the, the, the role of the rollover, so to speak, between drawings and the fabrication is a very interesting one because I sort of come in on it and go back over it. And then uh, it's almost as if my so-called day job, which isn't exactly demarcated like that, and my sort of so-called weekend artist job 
they roll over. Then they're, they're not defined. Though some people, as I seem to be having more and more and more exhibitions as as a kind of artiste, uh, I have to be careful because I think that my intention with these drawings is much more to do with the trajectory of architecture than it's to do with drawing per se. Uh, nonetheless, this this other view is is perpetuated. In, in, last year, I had both two books about my drawings published, one of which is the latest one is this called Speculations, which tracks me right from student days right through to the, the, the day before it went to print. And in fact, they're now drawings that are, can't be in the book. And we put, my, my publishers and my friends insisted on putting maybe the, the most outrageous drawing on the cover, one which perhaps needs quite a lot of explanation to, to, to link it to architecture as we know it. On the other hand, in, in early days, and so here I'm st stretching from being a sort of uh, living living uh, history to today, uh, I noticed that early drawings are much more to do with me mechanics, also to do with the notion of the disintegration of the city. So one starts off with a, 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 a city that is, is in interchangeable parts. It then moves to actually the notion that, that, that the main the sort of heart of the city, the cultural heart of the city, can be put on, on balloons or trucks and taken to small provincial towns. So the, 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 the sort of disassembly of the city becomes another conversation, which uh, I examine in this rather more abstract work, where I take something that looks a little bit like the plug-in city in the first instance, and then as a sequence, as we move across the drawings, the the hard hard assed parts of it disintegrate into soft things, spongy things, things that are ambiguous as whether they're you know fish flesh or fowl in in a sense. And then the the final stage is something that is a questionably architecture, but it's actually that the point being made is that it's still the city. The the, the formation evolves, but the wish for people to be sustained and enjoying themselves continues. And so that I, I go as a key drawing in a way still back to the early stage where you can still see plug-in elements, you can see a structure, you can see a main space uh, and where the softer parts are still being kept at bay. So for a long time, I've been interested in this issue of metamorphosis. Uh, sometime later, uh, with really absorbing, because one's been a teacher for such a long time, you absorb many of the conversations that are going on around you. I can remember one moment when I was teaching when everybody was talking about airships. I don't know why they were. And I then thought, yes, I can graft the notion of the airship onto my pre-existent idea of the, of the, um, the city that moves. And... Um, the later version had an airship at its generator. And, and then, you know, there's been so much conversation about vegetation, the incorporation of vegetation into hardware, into hard architecture, the, the soft, the soft edge. And so in I, in this project, I'm only going to show one drawing. In this project, I combined two notions, that of metamorphosis, uh, well, three really, also that of the, of the fully serviced uh, house, and uh, thirdly, the notion of the vegetation gradually morphing into the uh, technical aspects, the audiovisual things, the, the air supply, et cetera, et cetera. And in the final versions of this, the vines and the, and the, and the hedges have almost taken over the house. Now, sometimes these speculations go beyond the point of reasonableness. I suddenly sometimes it's about number five out of six. So, oh my God, what's going on? <laughs> the thing has got out of hand. And then I stop the series. Or I try in other cases to roll it over and say certain of the original conditions will probably obtain. Uh, sometimes I find myself in another city. This was for academic reasons. I was in Houston. And I was fascinated, as a non-car driver, by the way, I was fascinated by Houston and its endless just its, its endless interpretation and the fact that in the suburbs it was very difficult to identify where you are so there are three or four different conversations going on in these drawings one is the notion of using markers using something between a kind of billboard and a building to to mark the freeway and say we are here at this moment now we're at another place now we're at another place and then all sorts of other things that struck me 
quite curious uh, as to a whole waves of city under tree cover. Uh, looking at a small Spanish town and uh, doing a, a master plan for that, uh, one was interested in the idea, what, how do you bring back, it's probably a romantic idea, how do you bring back the sort of soul of a little town? How do you, how do you try and get the flaneur, the local gossip, the people on, on, on roller skates or on, on people who want to do local crafts? And, you know, the old thing of the, 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 the small town. And what I did is to stick the marketplace and all these come-go elements underneath the legs of the major building. I was later able to apply that in, in Madrid itself, except that the economy didn't seem to want to open kiosks. And then, of course, there are many much more abstract projects where I, they're really kind of workouts for mannerisms, working out the notion of the pylon, the in, interweed vegetation, the idea of skin, the idea of possible moving parts, and these are rather these are rather flat drawings. I realise they're they're almost like assemblages, rather yeah. than a, a three dimensional proposal. And then melting again in in Berlin, which is a city I had built in and I know well, uh, melting from and, and using a sort of vegetable analogy that it's a cactus that becomes a building, and then land where, where there's an ambiguity between what is the vegetated part. The architectural part and those which are part of each other. A, a recent, more recent idea, which is that if we have to build many more houses in in, in uh, rural sites, instead of building a sprawling village, you put the village in a single building and hide it in a forest. And there's the interrelationship between the sort of mystery and uh, attractiveness of the forest, rather than just general purpose countryside, is something that's another conversation. Or water, building on the water. I think that you know we will have to build on uh, on the water because it's we're going to be flooded. And of course, using the portmanteau element of the town, and the, these are always applied. Nobody's commissioned them, but I always apply them to cities that I know for at least a month. I don't do it on somebody I've been for two days. Uh, uh, actually, Brisbane, Tel Aviv, and Paris, because I know rather better than that. But in, in the, the few buildings that I do, I try to bring some of this cheerfulness, which uh, some of this optimism into actually built form. And of course, this is, is probably my best known thing here, where uh, once one had done it, and it was uh, already 20 years ago, uh, all those people who said, you know, all that archigram stuff, it can't be done. Yeah, no, it's, it's, all, it's all art, you know, it's artiste. And you just do the bloody thing. And then people say, oh, um, oh, uh, well, uh, maybe. And I think that's an important, important thing. And, and one I can't talk about but more recently is in the, in the same tradition. This is actually a, a house with a kind of three-dimensional theater incorporated into the house. I, I'm interested now in, in following through with uh, examining fabrication as part of the assembly. Uh, and then I'm also interested in, 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 in decoy. I've always been interested that things are not full frontal, that they can actually be seen in, in a series of, of layers. And then maybe the layers are interdependent. Some of the things are not in your face. So maybe, 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 maybe. And a recent moment where I, got, I take this, uh, this notion of layering uh, there are capsules, there are vegetated parts, but then there's a series of sort of almost decoy layers, which are partly physical protection, but are partly to do with a, a, a back into the forest in a, in a curious way. Uh, but then other things sort of come back. I, I'm, the theatricality of, of cities, I think, is something that clearly has been very, very difficult in recent times because the prosaic nature of sensible economic blocks and then what do you do in the bits in between is a very stark condition. Whereas, of course, my favorite cities and towns are those where there's a considerable ambiguity as to whether something is hard, soft, spooky, hidden, mysterious, funky, straightforward. I, I love parts of Tokyo where, you know, there's a, a very a corporate sort of office block, but not necessarily terribly big. And next to it is a bit of hickory dickory and then the next thing is somebody with art sort of smart architecture and then there's another funny thing poking out of the side um 
I would I I I, I, I crave to continue that tradition. And also then discrete city, which is also to do with mystery. Uh, this, which was connected with some of the work I've been doing in, in Saudi Arabia, is a proposal. You do have vast, vast conditions of housing, but then you interweave with it a, a sort of deliberately naughty condition, where the origins of which you can probably see in some of my other work. And here we have the exhibition or the exhibit, uh, which something's interested me and, and some of my colleague sitting here also did a lot of work on this project. And we, we, we disintegrated two drawings, which each of the drawings in themselves has its own story. But the, what I'm looking at now is, is, is almost actually physically jumping from the, the sort of distanced, neat drawn thing, and then the enclosure of space. I think there can be a hybrid where parts of the of the environment can be, if you if you like, looking to the future, and parts of them doing extremely sensible things like you know, leading to the toilet or keeping the wind out or whatever they might have to be doing. Great, thank you so much, Peter. If you could uh, bring us back to the screen, perfect. That was absolutely fascinating and so incredible to see so many of your of your amazing drawings that you've created over the years. And I uh, had the pleasure of seeing some of them in person very recently. Um, and the level of detail is hard to hard to bring to the, to the small screen here. But I'd love to hear a little bit. I mean, I'd, obviously, the drawings of yours that people are probably most familiar with are some of those early ones you did with Archogram, um, the plugin city being the one that that everyone knows the best. But I'm really interested to know how the kind of role of drawing you know, has has it kind of has it changed in your work in the way that the kind of relationship between drawing and architecture? Obviously, it's a sort of vehicle for ideas, um, but I'd I'd love to know kind of whether you, for you the sort of the drawing has kind of maybe taken on a different function in some way. I think that that, that once you start to do buildings, as a very you know that uh, so many of my very very talented friends here in London and and some in the states uh, are are potentially very good architects, but amazing drawers. And then they get into drawing and teaching and that becomes a kind of comfort zone. And I have, am at pains to, to tr use what has happened say in the last 20 years or so, which is that actually I can do buildings as well. And that I find that they're bits of the, but not exactly bits of those actual buildings, but bits of things where in, in day to day ones considering how pieces work, how, how things, you know, keep the water out or how they sit, sit out of the ground or how they stand up. Uh, and I've always worked with very, very particularly good engineers. I, I'm very keen on certain engineers. And uh, they feed back into the drawing. The drawings, I think, are not as... Uh, Anyway, they're not as loopy as they used to be. They may be still <laughs> just as loopy, but they they take on board certain things that I have experienced from building, because it's very odd when you start building, as opposed to being somebody who talked and drew and was known for that and for these sort of whatever ideas. Uh, you start seeing what the effect of a piece of beam in the early morning is. You see the effects of radiators on a wall, which you hadn't sort of taken into consideration. You see certain conditions of reflectivity, depending on how you position the glass or what sort of glass it is. I mean, these sound like very straight up and down things, but they, they feed back into the uh, sort of uh, idea drawings that you say, yes, there's something about, well, I think it's where, that's where the sort of veils thing and the layers thing came in that I couldn't have imagined <laughs> before I started having to experience the effect of light, the effect of sound, the effect of the presence of the object. I remember once going to Himmelblau's uh, museum in Groningen, and my son was only about three and a half, and he was running and running and running around this metal building. And it was this extraordinary, and, and I, I videoed it, it was the extraordinary sound of a child flanking around on a metal building done by my, done by my friends. Now, before the kid, before going in that building, I would have never really particularly thought about that. And it's really amazing. You know, I, I, I think I um, I love the fact that, 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 that behind here, I'm still at home, um, 
there's a, we have a long garden with old trees and and occasionally as you well know in london you get mist there's a wonderful thing where you get the mist and then you get the profile there's a sort of building with an og dome just down the road and you get this weird interface of the, of the all is not immediately obvious the og dome in the in the sort of filth of mist is amazing normal mm. oh it's a sort of og dome thank you very much and i'm very interested in in in, in this ambiguity and i think there's a connection between that and probably my early notion of 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 the melting architecture the changing architecture i'm a very restless person i have a, a low threshold of boredom and and you know once you've seen one sort of 20 50 story slab concrete thing you've seen the lot in a way i mean i i know some people do it better some people do it. but i so i find uh, some problems with chinese cities that they have raced ahead and got enormous 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 but there's not a, there's no soft edges. There's some somebody clever comes and plants a nice little community building or restaurant or mm. thing like that. But it, it doesn't make a city. It's a sort of series of sort of staccato sentences placed alongside mm. rather than a flowing conversation. But that's <laughs> I like to state that straight off because it, it it sort of intrigues me, but at a certain point it bores me. Mm. And. Was this the first time you've looked at Beijing and, you know, sort of thinking about it, like through drawing, exploring Beijing and looking at the future oh, of Beijing? I have a terrible confession. I have never been to Beijing. My goodness. Okay. I've been, so this I've is been a, a few times <laughs> to Shanghai and some other places, and I'm very familiar with Hong Kong, uh, mm. but I have never been to Beijing. I'm slightly mm. scared of Beijing because there's certain things I hear about it that suggest I wouldn't like it very much. <laughs> uh, my wife has been and she thought it was amazing. But she had a good time. So, <laughs> and how did when you were sort I, of there certain indicators that I, I I'm a bit terrified of very hard cities. So I I like I love Los Angeles and I hate Chicago. If that mm -hmm. makes a point. And so when you were sort of looking at looking at this, you know, sort of taking on this project for this exhibition, how did your how did your kind of experience of Beijing, you know, what what were the sort of well, the big kind of take homes and Sorry, for, sorry, what You've were the ideas you kind of question, brought into I this? I can't answer it. What I can say is that, in a sense, what I do on, in, in your installation might be considered a bit of a provocation. In the mm -hmm. sense of saying, I don't know how you guys in Beijing will take this because it's not to do with the sort of stuff that I've seen illustrated that you do. But you do have a few naughty, and you showed one this morning, that you have a few naughty architects firms, but I think they're only doing stuff around the edges. It's all, also the problem I have with Hong Kong. I have a number of extremely talented friends in Hong Kong, but they're only allowed to do stuff in the corners and in, inside. Mm. The actual stuff is these things we're familiar with. Mm. Well, let's, let's move on uh, to our third presentation that we have, um, we have now, uh, which is um, Drawing Architecture Studio. So Li Han and Hu Yan, uh, please share with us your presentation. Yeah, thank you, Amy. Okay, um, so it works. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, we are from doing architecture studio yeah. and uh, the practice of our office is uh, quite different from other um, from, from the conventional uh, architectural studios that uh, we don't really design buildings. We uh, uh, do a lot of uh, architectural drawings and models and use them to do uh, urban studies and to create artworks. Yeah. And here are some examples of the uh, like the large scale murals we did in different cities uh, as public art. And we, li we look at this kind of drawings as uh, building materials that will help probably help to change the perception of a space. And we also do a lot of uh, uh, installations for uh, exhibitions. And uh, many of them, them are site specific and uh, they are also inspired by the urban environment and uh, by the uh, everyday life. And uh, also uh, publication is a very important media to us that we use books to uh, uh, summarize our uh, uh, thinkings uh, about the city uh, through drawings and models. 
And uh, we must mention that it's really great honor to have the uh, opportunity today to have conversation with uh, Sir Peter Cook and uh, Mr. Ma Yen Song. And we haven't uh, had the chance to meet you in person yet, uh, but we have portrayed your designs in our uh, drawing. This is a piece we did uh, three years ago uh, for M Plus in Hong Kong, and it is uh, for the event uh, Archigram Cities. And uh, now it is a mural presented at uh, M Plus. And uh, in the drawings, we included the uh, uh, plug-in city from Peter and uh, uh, Superstar from uh, from Mar. And uh, both of your uh, works have uh, given us a lot of inspiration in our drawings. And um, for this uh, exhibition, Blueprint Beijing, uh, we the contribution is our contribution is called a restaurant inside the wall. Uh, the main focus of our um, research has always been uh, the everyday space, everyday life in the urban space. And we always try to focus on how to transform such a situation into our own work. And this project is actually a very good example to show how such creation is developed. So uh, the whole project is based on some uh, views we we found in our own neighborhood in Beijing. And uh, this is a river uh, that's next to our apartment building. You can see that because in Beijing it's very dry and we don't have a lot of rain. So the water, water, the river, uh, most of the time it's just, uh, uh, you just see the river bed. And uh, then uh, there's between the river and the apartment building, there's a long road converted into parking lot for the residents. And between the parking lot and the apartment building, there's a small fence. These are some uh, uh, street side uh, food cart you will find everywhere in the city because they are not registered businesses. So they can only show up during night and uh, at the corner of the street. And in winter time, some of them, they will cover their carts uh, with canopy. And what's interesting about this image is that behind this food cart, particularly on this uh, parking lot, there's a restaurant. Uh, if you see the, uh, you can see the, the red signage here, uh, reads the name of the restaurant. It's called Riverside Restaurant. The, the name of the restaurant actually gives us the, the whole total inspiration for our uh, piece. And after a while, the restaurant uh, was gone and uh, the opening was sealed with cement, but somehow they, uh, they remain the, uh, they keep this uh, shutter door. And to us, this is really a very absurd, uh, uh, surreal scene. So these are all the uh, materials we have and uh, we try to make them into a comic story. And so we, we set the background of our story in with this uh, cold and uh, emotionless big city, just like Beijing. And people uh, live like a robust. Uh, they just repeat their life, every, the same life every day. And from this image, you can see that uh, there's no river and there's no restaurant. And the, the bottom here, you see uh, some cars parking along the fence. And then there's um, a door. Uh, in uh, along this uh, fence, and uh, in front of in in front of the wall, there's a shutter door, and uh, in front of the shutter door, there's a very fancy car. Uh, there's nothing behind the wall, so it looks a little bit uh, mysterious. And on the right, you will see the protagonist of our story, and he's the owner of this uh, very long food cart. He sells um, a simple version of Chinese hot pot. And because he cannot afford any physical space to run the restaurant, so he has to drive his food car to the neighborhood every day and to use a vacant parking spot. And this particular spot is in front of this uh, shutter door. And uh, in the daytime, the fence car always parks here. And the owner is actually a, a dog. It is a driverless car. So here we just try to make fun of, of this kind of um, high technology in our current life. And uh, after the car leaves, the owner will park his food cart and start his preparation for the business of tonight. And uh, if you look at those uh, small vehicles, small businesses, uh, you will find that uh, the owners, they, they usually will do a lot of very creative, uh, creative uh, modifications for their vehicle in order to make it convenient for the business. And so we try to follow this approach and uh, we designed this uh, special version of a hot, a hot pot uh, food cart for this protagonist. And uh, we follow the idea from this uh, kind of uh, conveyor belt uh, sushi bar and uh, make this rotating system for the dishes. 
And uh, so to us, this is a low tech version of how people can use technology in their life. And the turning point of the story comes with the rain. As the water accumulates in the riverbed, now the river starts to show up. And uh, when the rain gets heavier, the owner finally opens this shutter door. And behind it, we find there's a retractable canopy. The owner put it uh, completely out of the wall and uh, covered his foot cart. So here we we can see a space looks very uh, similar to a restaurant. It's enclosed finally. And uh, also he turned down his the, the light for the signage it, and it reads Riverside Restaurant. So this is the climax of the whole story. Uh, only this in this particular moment with this weather, we will have the river and we will have the Riverside Restaurant converted from the food cart. Um, to us, this is also a moment very uh, surreal and uh, somehow romantic in this uh, rainy, rainy night. And uh, on the other day, when the rain is gone, everything goes back to normal. The, the dog is back with his fancy car and the people just uh, go back to work as usual. So you can see that the whole narrative is not based on something dramatic, not any dramatic plots, but it's based on the transition of the space. And uh, after we finished the story, uh, we received an invitation from, uh, from Ma for this uh, exhibition at uh, Beijing Biennale. At the beginning, we thought that we want to actually make this a uh, food cart. Yeah. But because, the, uh, because of the limited time and the budget, in the end, we decided to only to reproduce this, uh, the scene from the story. And we found it's actually become more interesting because when you detach all these kind of urban elements from the reality and put it into an exhibition hall, uh, it looks even more uh, surreal and uh, absurd and uh, mysterious. And uh, we, we think that people might find more uh, uh, curious about this uh, whole piece. So um, this is how it looks like in the exhibition that we uh, made uh, this parking spot without car and uh, we have the wall and uh, install this uh, shutter door. Behind it, you can see the, the drawings, uh, the, in the, the image in line drawing that uh, indicates is a temporarily existed restaurant and also with a signage. So uh, the audience might ask the question that what is this for when they see this side of the installation? We want to give them the answer uh, with our comics. And the way we present our comics is uh, inspired by this kind of old fashioned newspaper bulletin board we can find everywhere in the old neighborhoods. And um, people still read news in this way. And uh, we think it's perfect for our comics. So we make this one for the other side of the uh, uh, installation and uh, people can read the story just like reading a newspaper. Uh, yeah, so in, in general, that our installation has two sides. Uh, one side is to uh, give a question to the audience and then the other side is to give the, um, the answer. And we also um, have a small, uh, not included in the exhibition, but we have made a small handmade uh, paper model for this uh, special version of a uh, food cart. And this is actually from uh, what one uh, larger project we are still working on. It's called uh, City of the Machine. And the whole project is based on the observation about these kind of small vehicles you find in the big cities. And uh, they are transformed uh, by the owners and to, to run small, all kinds of small businesses. All these owner, owners, they cannot afford any single space in this expensive city. So they can only uh, like uh, uh, purchase, the only property they have is this, this kind of small vehicle. And uh, so they drive them everywhere in the city and uh, they, they if they find somewhere appropriate, they will stop there and occupy that small public space for a while to run their business. And if they are questioned or driven away, they will just leave and try to come back again when it's safer. So uh, to us, we look at this kind of uh, guerrilla style way of doing business, like uh, resistance, uh, resilience to this um, increasingly expensive urban environment. And uh, we look at them as uh, the in how powerless uh, individuals to fight against the uh, big system. So uh, we uh, try to use uh, models to portray this kind of use of public space and uh, try to make speculations about how crazy this design could be for these kind of small vehicles. 
And uh, we hope that we can open the discussion about um, how individuals can use public space when everything uh, for in the big uh, cities becomes so unaffordable to most of people. And uh, uh, also as a response to the uh, theme of the uh, exhibition, the future, uh, we borrowed the book title from So Fujimoto, Primitive uh, Future. In his book, he was talking about uh, primitive uh, forms of nature, like a uh, forest or cave to uh, inspire his design. But to us here, a primitive means the basic form of life, the only thing you can use to, to change, change your life. So uh, when we talk about future, uh, personally, we like to take a very uh, individual approach that uh, we think that, um, and, and it probably is just a fact that not everyone has the privilege to enjoy the latest technology or best thing the world can offer to you. Uh, most of us, we have to live with what we have. So we stay. We try to stay very uh, realistic and uh, cautious about the future, and we believe in that the future might not be something necessarily be something ambitious, but it may be just something very uh, down to earth. So this will be our answer to curator. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Jan. That was absolutely fascinating to hear about what goes into into the projects that you work on, and you have an incredible. Uh, ability to analyze the sort of fine grain of the city. And I'm really interested to hear actually a little bit more about, I mean, it's a quite a unique practice that you have in that, you know, you are your architects and you're, you're, you're sort of looking in such fine grain at the city and, but the result is not a building. You're not actually making architecture. You're, you're creating this incredible narrative product, um, which is, which is really, really great to see. And I'm curious if you sort of think maybe sort of similar to Peter further down the line, you know, this will maybe uh, become become architecture maybe in years to come, or do you know? It, do you, do you sort of see yourselves very much more as sort of storytellers and 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 analysts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's very <laughs> good uh, question that we kept um, asking ourselves. That um, uh, of course, like we we take drawing uh, or models or these tools as very uh, unique tools like we can use as architects. Yeah. And uh, we think that there, there are a lot of uh, potential and a lot of things that other media cannot do if you are not like architects or you, you're not looking at the world in this way. And uh, for now, like to um, answer your question about how to connect the drawing to the design some way, for now, probably we don't see that connection in our work yet because uh, when we do our drawings and models, we don't really, we, we don't really uh, do it from a, a practical point of view, right? Yeah, probably. Um, actually, uh, I just uh, heard Peter's mention that, you know, stay in drawing and model is kind of com comfortable zone for yeah, us. Yeah, uh, it I would is. admit, <laughs> it I would admit because building a real actor is really a tough job. Yeah. But uh, because uh, actually we the uh, we we kind of work uh, uh, design real building before before mm -hmm. we uh, open our uh, start our, our practice yeah uh, but sometimes I feel you know um, uh, what when we look at the city a lot of phenomenon a lot of interesting things really not about building something but mm -hmm. just there and uh, it shows us. And it has nothing to do with uh, construction or building something. It just sometimes it's not to solve because for me sometimes when you build something you solve problem, you kind of give a, a solution to clients. But sometimes if you in city you look at the space, you don't need you don't have any problem. You just enjoy it, and you don't need to give solution. You just to present it. So uh, that's our the first. The motivation mm -hmm. to do that sort of work to yeah. uh, firstly present it, record it, because it changes all the time. Some phenomenon disappear, so we try to do that. And uh, gradually, we kind of uh, you know develop this type of practice, just using uh, drawing as a, the main. Media, yeah. main media to yeah. practice yeah. yeah but of course we are very open to the idea that if we can make something in the yeah. end yeah. because we're still looking forward to <laughs> yeah. something we never got permission to do that so uh yeah. i think after yeah um so but for we, us maybe the installation is also can yeah, include yeah. Could any, as a some sort of construction so thanks Ma, to give us a chance to get yeah. this 
yeah. construct. Yeah, yeah, but definitely we hope that um, someday we can realize our um, or transform our observation from the everyday into um, architect architecture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not only stay as a drawing or models. Mm -hmm. And I mean, let's let's sort of open up this now to a little bit more of a wider conversation and. Ma, as I understand it, your sort of brief to, to these guys and also to the other exhibitors uh, mm -hmm. at the exhibition was you sort of posed them a couple of questions. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the questions that you sort of asked of them um, and I guess what you were kind of, what, what you were sort of expecting in response or sort of maybe how their responses uh, exceeded or, or were different to, to your expectations. Um, it's basically uh, talking about how people think about the future. And, and that's basically all the questions we ask ourselves as a designer, because everything we create now is about a better uh, future, right? So uh, it's interesting to, to share different answers in this exhibition. <clears throat> I think, I think uh, today was interesting because uh, we showed two uh, very different architects and uh, from different uh, uh, context, but you see the uh, similarity and uh, they all use drawings. They also uh, showed uh, different uh, aspects of, uh, of uh, the, the, the power of the, the architecture and, and, uh, and drawings. Um, I think that's already different uh, understanding about the future. Uh, like what Hu Yan just mentioned, that their, their, their observation about the reality is the, the, the starting point of the narrative and, and their work. Uh, it's, it's different from, you know, many of us think about the future is a, is a science fiction movie. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a far away, it, but it's, it's actually linked to our daily life. So uh, I, I like what you mentioned uh, romantic. I think that that's a very beautiful wor uh, word uh, to describe your work. It looks very practical. Um, it's basic. It's based on the uh, on the daily life, but uh, you find the moment and uh, and uh, emotional quality uh, uh, for architects, like what we can bring to the to to the society, and and. But Peter, Peter I, you see it clearly the, how, how Peter's work uh, evolved. Right? It's a melting. It's, I think it's more, uh, later on, I will have a question for you guys. It's very, uh, very natural and organic. It's very different from your early work. Uh, but, but, but still, for many audience, for many of us, it's very abstract. It almost looked like uh, artist's work. It's... <laughs> it's uh, of course, you 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 show the architecture. You you, you draw some architecture element, but uh, people keep thinking that's a very personal expression, very unique expression about your vision. Um, it's a bit uh, uh, different from their 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 uh, daily or practical uh, um, uh, <coughs> part of the uh, part part of the world. So I think that that's a two aspects. Or already showed uh, the, 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 the discussion about uh, how we see about the, uh, about the future. Uh, I think all this discussion is, is very important because uh, I think today's uh, world is quite uh, practical. Like people will ask why you're making this, why are you making these drawings? Because why you think about these uh, issues is a future or, or vision or personal um, visionary uh, um, image is is it important? Uh, so so it's important to 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 link these uh, visions to our life. Like like that that's what we want to show in, in this in this exhibition. Like. Um, mm. um, how how uh, why the vision is is, uh, is important to us? So, and you see that as the the job of the architect, really, to sort of uh, to link these two things, to link the idea of a vision for the future with yeah. Yeah, our, think, sort of the, the day to day in our cities. 
Yeah, I think the beauty of the exhibition is uh, we have all different answers from from different people. <laughs> so so uh, so people when the, the visitors come, they will they will they will observe, they will listen, and they will uh, see the the story behind it. Uh, uh, that that's very important. Also, uh, we show some. Uh, um, a documentary from the past. Those those visionary work already shows the result or or, or achievement in the, in the past. How, how this uh, research affect education, uh, uh, young architects, the education like uh, they all both um, they're all teaching now. Uh, so that's also probably one of my question like what young architects can do now. Like in that's. Also, the question I, I, I keep uh, uh, get from other young architects, like, should they uh, become more practical uh, so they can work in, in this uh, difficult uh, time, or uh, they can be uh, keep the, uh, the visionary uh, the, 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 uh, about the future? So I understand every you all have some questions for each other. So I'm going to ask the other panelists. Uh, maybe Peter, maybe you can go first. Maybe you'd like to respond to to Mar's question and give your opinion. Yes, I think that because having a, a long memory, uh, I have to state that in fact, because I was brought up as a as a, a functionalist architect, you know, everything was to do with it, does it work, and and there's a certain what I call it Puritan, uh, almost Calvinist streak in, in in the sort of English thinking, which is that, that it, you, you, it's like, like sort of cold baths. And at the moment, it, it we're being subjected to a considerable amount of cold bath treatment, meaning, you know, everything's got to be about sustain. I mean, you have to say sustainability rather like Catholics have to make a sign of the cross. You have to say that at the beginning of every, every, every introduction of any building. And it sort of gets on your nerves after a while because everybody's been very worthy, very po-faced. Yes, yes, we know we have problems. There's a war, there's famine, there's da 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 da, da. Yes, 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 yes. And brought up as a functionist, you don't put the draining board in a stupid place. You don't put the toilet in a stupid place. You do try and use timber economically, etc. That, for me, goes as, goes as given. What I've also been interested in, two things that came up in the conversation. One is, one is that uh, there is this interest in in what appear to be the trivia of towns that actually can lead to an understanding of, of towns. I I didn't include it in here, but I, I, as everybody who knows me knows, collect kiosks. I go around the world and I photo, I don't photograph the, you know, many of the, but I photograph the kiosk because the kiosk is doing something sensible like serving coffee or, or sausages or something. And then it tells you a lot about the place. If you're very into kiosks, you can su surmise the difference between a Norwegian kiosk and a Swedish kiosk. Difference between a Vienna kiosk and a Berlin kiosk. It's fascinating. And it tells you about the way in which the, 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 the sort of objectives or the spirit of the locality affects something which is a straight up and down requirement. And I'm, I was also reminded of, of you know, people like Atelier Bauer who have been looking at, at urban trivia and then drawing certain conclusions from it, from which one can design. I, this, actually, in, in, in the uh, Pinto project, which I showed briefly, the, the kiosks are absolutely the, the key clue to the way that the whole thing works. Uh, so that's one thing that comes up. Uh, another thing, I, I, I was fascinated by your work in that it reminded me of, of Juan O'Gorman in Mexico City. Who is a as a student, I was fascinated by this library with this thing on the end of it. And finally I got there. And then I started to link it by sort of researching on, online, actually, uh, other things that he'd done. And the, and the guy probably went bonkers by the end of his life. But it, uh, the way in which he started off all, all as a very elegant sort of Caboosian um, architect doing the, the house for Frida Kahlo and her husband. Into two houses, which is all could almost be called. And then he does this this mural, and then the, and later he seems to do these in his house or something. The, the, the drawing has taken him over. Mm -hmm. uh, now I don't propose that I, I I don't think I've gone as 
balmy as him yet. But uh, I think all these things are strands from which we draw on and another subplot. And I think this comes from being a, a, a teacher is that I, what I have to admit is one of the things that fascinates me most about architecture and why I draw what I draw is I'm really interested in vocabulary, the act, actual vocabulary of architecture, the actual range of things that we can do with what we have and what we design. You know, I think our vocabulary of what we do with windows is incredibly narrow. You know, we've hardly moved in a hundred years. You know, what we do with the turning a wall around a corner. Yes, we have computers and they can introduce another bit of vocabulary, but now even that is starting to get predictable. You know, it's going to swoop and it's going to swoop in a certain way. And it's falling into a sort of academic trap. So I, I have to say that the subplot running through all of this and a conscious subplot is, yes, OK, let's have a draining board in the right place. Yes, let's have a sensible you know, corner of a street. Let's have a, a very useful thing that allows you know, veg vegetables to grow up it or whatever. But how do you do it? Because so far, a lot of these things are being done very repetitive. There they are, another one, another one. But, and, and, and because of the, the kind of current piety, the current sort of extreme morality of teaching at the moment, everybody's nervous to be naughty. Uh, and so they're not really exploring. You can get great artistic creatives, you know, like yourselves, or you can get, you know, people like me who, you draw, but then then are forced in, in the field to cut it back, cut it back, cut it back. What you see is that then when one sort of has a rear guard, you don't you cut as little of it back as you can. But I think there's another architecture waiting to respond to these problems, which is a kind of amalgam, you know, that's not based upon having to fit in with the house across the street, not you know, the usual way that we put in windows is this, the usual way in which we, you know, deal with handrails is that we were having a long conversation yesterday about handrails. And and what people can do or do with handrails is incredibly primitive. You know, haven't moved beyond I know. Mm. In fact, I would say, this is a funny one, that the Victorian period in certainly in the West. Uh, was probably the most creative. I, I, when I was a student, that was trained out of me. I was told that Victorian was terrible, and you know, I lived in a town little Victoriana. But actually, they were very inventive. They they would go here, they would go there, and they would go somewhere else to add add things and make them appear to be interesting and agreeable. But I'm fantastic. fantastic. And. Jan, Jan and Han, do you do you kind of have a take on this? Is your sort of experience similar? Do you think uh, do you think there's a sort of reluctance to for for people to to be naughty, as Peter suggests? <laughs> uh, yes, maybe some in some way. Uh, if we look at the the works, let's that's, that's the reason probably one sometimes when we look back to the history of architecture, uh, look like look at the works by. Uh, like from Peter from his generation or like works from the maybe even the 1980s. You feel like at that time, uh, you feel like the architecture might be even more wild at that time. Oh, yeah. even, although, actually, I mean, in terms of technology, it's uh, now we have a better technology. We can build whatever we want, right? Whatever we imagined. Um, yeah, but uh, or probably we, want, we are not in a good position to say that because we don't do, do buildings back ourselves but uh but we believe that this kind of uh change of interest or the uh the, the braveness okay. like uh in creation maybe it varies from yeah. time to time or just uh, influenced by the uh, the current context of the social or the economy or the other thinkings that will influence the uh, the creation as well yeah. And also, actually, we we have, uh, we have some questions actually to Peter and to Mark. Can I uh, ask? Please, please. Uh, <laughs> about future. Yeah. About the future. Maybe not not uh, 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 because we we interest in the drawing and uh, uh, Peter did a lot of drawing. Uh, actually, we get a lot of inspiration from drawing. So my. Our first question may goes to uh, Peter uh, about the drawing. Uh, 
actually, uh, I'm really interested in, you know, I really want to know, you know, the process of drawing because I'm made drawing by, my, uh, by ourselves. So we re really interested in the process because from our observation, uh, you, you can always use hand made drawing, use pen to do the outlines, mm -hmm. color with uh, what, uh, what colors, uh, the style, uh, the material use kind of, um, uh, similar for quite a long time so uh i'm wondering how do you make drawing? because some drawings are really complicated do you use tracing paper or sort of things and do you use computer to help you to make this drawing so i'm curious about this so uh, okay uh because it's a very long process and, and i was not a good drawer at, at school I, even in my first small architecture school there were many people in the class who could draw, you know, horses, trees, all that stuff. And I was a bit painful and I could only use it with a, using one of those, you know, yeah. And, 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 and one of these, they're sitting on here now because I'm using them earlier this morning. But in, 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 the, in the office, I'm surrounded by guys, you know, who can, and, and ladies who can just whistle this stuff out at the drop of a hat. Um, there's a sub conversation, which is, does that make it too easy that you need a bit of struggle in order to have time to think? But I, I won't digress on that. Um, yeah, it was a slow process. Gradually, I learned, I, I was always surrounded by people who could draw better than me, including very close associates. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you just have to sort of try not to let the side down. Then you gradually pick up a few tricks. And always the idea was so I was so determined to get the idea out that I just sweated it. You know, I'd, I'd, I think drawing the corner is always extremely difficult. If you can do a corner, then you can do most of the other things. And, and then um, I know I'm still drawing more or less how I did 50 years ago. Um, I'm quicker. I know the tricks of avoiding things I don't do very well. I use as good of materials as I can find. You know, spend more on the paper, blah blah blah. But it's also um, that now here's a here's a question: whether one now does drawings incorporating pieces that you know that you can do, uh, falling into the traps that I've just been saying earlier, or do you try and push push your not necessarily technique but the combinatory aspects? And that's I think what I've been doing. Lately, I, I, I draw in a certain way. I know what I can control. I know what I can get done in time for a deadline or an exhibition or whatever it might be. Um, but I, I, the combinatory nature, I got just doing something now where I'm combining wind machines into what appears to be a soft territory. And what I'm, I'm thinking about is should the junction say it establishes the point at which it becomes a machine? Or should it grow out of the softness? And there's this plus and minus for each of those. Things like that, I just draw like I draw. I draw with rotary pens, which are getting increasingly hard to find. Uh, and I draw more often now on good paper rather than on tracing paper. Uh, that means if you fuck it up, <laughs> you're lost. You have to start again <laughs> so you don't <laughs> fuck it up. And I'm very good at, at, at dealing with mistakes. And I'm, I think, um, but in the daytime, you know, anything that we're working on immediately, you know, after I've scribbled around or my colleagues have scribbled around, somebody is, is whistling through the computers faster than I can even talk. Mm. Then sometimes you need to go back over it. Can I, can I interrupt here? Because I'm concerned we're a little bit short of time and I have a question I'd love, like to ask Ma actually. Um, which I think kind of touches on what we've just been talking about is, you know, kind of putting together this exhibition and, and bringing together sort of, I think sort of 20, 20 sort of visions of, of the future of Beijing. And then also kind of looking at these ideas from the past, these archive ideas, do you sort of, do you get a sense of, you know, what, what, what we think the future looks like? How, how much has it changed from what we used to think the, the future looked like? Do you know, do you think our ideas and our dreams for the future are our kind of visions? Are shifting or do you sort of think that uh you know that they kind of stay fairly stationary or sort of fairly kind of uh fairly constant so definitely 
definitely shifting. It's always changing. Also, the future is uh, is not common. It's uh, for everyone. It's a uh, sometimes it's just very personal. You know, it's a, some sometimes it's a, even emotional. But I just find that's a beautiful. You know, that's uh, that shows the humanity of, in our city that people are different and uh, and people thinking about different things. And on on, rev on the opposite side, it, it's it's the pr very practical world that I feel the the very strong atmosphere <laughs> in today's society that uh, uh, it's more about uh, 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 producing and how we can uh, producing, how we build, how we you know actually may make things, but not ideas and the thinkings. So, so, so th that's that's the the beauty of this uh, collection. We have all these beautiful minds and uh, uh, concept ideas uh, behind those uh, works and the installations and drawings and models to show their thinking. Um, so, so I think that's definitely um, uh, give the energy to the visitors. That that uh, you know when people see our reality and they find the surrealness the romantic atmosphere in this room and they will have the the hope they will have start their their, their own journey about mm -hmm. the imagination uh, of of our their own life and uh, and uh, other people's the community how, you know how we think about the future that that discussion or dialogue could begin after after this mm -hmm. so 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 i think that's definitely um um, the the our goal uh, uh, for this exhibition. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to ask a question. Uh, well, a question we've been asked. One of our one of our audience members, someone on YouTube, is wrote in with a question that I think is quite good, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on. Um, the question is: Recently in the UK, there's been a discussion on 15 minute cities, and it's been a kind of a, an interesting an interesting kind of dynamic between architects and politicians, and. Um, the question is: Would you say Beijing could could learn from this idea of the fifteen minute city? Um, like, could it take it forward due to its population density and increasing need for sort of for large social housing? Do you do you think the idea of the fifteen minute city is maybe something that could be interesting for Beijing? Yes, I think Beijing is definitely uh, very hard on people on <laughs> this matter because the, the the scale and the size. I mean, Shanghai is better, right? Shanghai has a more walkable uh, 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 planning that they have uh, like uh, small stores and supermarkets close to your home. But here is definitely super difficult to 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 do that. Um, but I think it, it's a, it's a something we should uh, we should raise the, uh, the, the 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 issue. I think it's important. Mm. Anyone else have any thoughts on this on this point? Uh, for me, actually, yeah, I would agree with Ma that Beijing is a kind of city uh, sort of based on the car, but not totally. Uh, and uh, but but one thing I feel interesting is that it's not a comfortable city, but uh, sometimes I I feel this rawness, this <laughs> uncomfortable <laughs> toughness is important to city. Uh, that make people become more, you know, uh, stronger. Or sometimes <laughs> they focus on the, not enjoy many things, but focus on the work. That's kind of uh, some inspiration in Beijing, I think. Which uh, this aspect actually we both uh, like and hate. Sometimes yeah. hate the environment of Beijing, but sometimes feel only in Beijing we can get the work done. So this kind of mixed feeling. Um, but also, I'm curious about the because to me, Beijing is sort of like Los Angeles based on the car, and uh, maybe Shanghai more like Chicago. So when Peter mentioned he like Los Angeles, he hate Chicago. I'm a little bit uh, curious about why, <laughs> because actually Los, Los Angeles is not a city uh, kind of you can do 15 minutes circle. No, no, that's probably not. Yeah. And I think actually, before you answer this, Peter, actually, this kind of leads into what I think might be a good kind of uh, sort of conscious of our time, what might be a good kind of question for you all to kind of think about to end on, which is 
what makes what makes a good city and this actually kind of was based on a question from uh, peter from linkedin who wrote in and said he'd ask like what can you explain what you think makes a city and yeah i'd love to maybe from all of you to just hear what what you think makes a city um what what makes it great what 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 are the ideas what are the sort of elements of a city that we should be championing as we look ahead to the future who would like to go first i i can i can uh, i think uh, the the humanity the the um the human quality uh, that's that's the key especially in the many big cities like in in beijing for example uh, they were not designed for uh people <laughs> the the, the it's, so so it's a, it's important to talk about issues around uh, uh people as a, as a, like an individual uh person so that's that's why i think uh the future the topic about the future is 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 important for everyone involved it's not mm -hmm. some abstract uh um the, uh like intellectual topic you know it's a, it's a link to the daily life and uh, uh, I think it's a very necessary now to um, for uh, for the city, for like like mm -hmm. Beijing. Mm -hmm. Peter, what about you? What do you think makes uh, uh, makes yes, a city? It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, I'd love to have an hour to talk about this, but uh, it's it's to do. I think uh, a good city is cosmopolitan. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. Some cities are more cosmopolitan than others. I'm lucky to live in a at this, at this moment, still a very cosmopolitan city. And I think variety is important, not only formal variety, that is to say things that are not just predictable objects, uh, and but, but a, a variety of type of people, variety of type of experience, places where the, the, the nervous can hide and the, and the exuberant can show off and the sort of, the sort of quizzical can sniff around. And the kind of straight up and down can be straight up and down without being criticized. That's why Los Angeles and London are very societally open. I know it's being argued. They're, they're full of different sorts of people. They're very creative cities, a lot of creatives, a lot of people who just can hide away. A lot of people can choose to hide away on a Wednesday and, and be overt on a Tuesday. That kind of city. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether Be Beijing still, from what all you're saying, I don't think I'd I even think I'd like it less than I thought at the beginning of the program. <laughs> Peter, you'll have to go there and I'll report back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and Jan and Han, do you have uh, any sort of end notes of what you think makes a makes a city work? Yeah, we, we totally agree with uh, Peter and with Mar about the uh, what's good city, good city is about. And uh, to us, it's, uh, I think it's always about uh, giving people options for good, like for good, yeah. being a good city. Oh, That's yeah, that because uh, like big cities like uh, Beijing or London or like, um, I think they are attractive because they are really huge and uh, everyone, uh, hopefully <laughs> that uh, most people, they can, you can find all you want to do and you won't be maybe judged too much by the single standard. I think that's very important. Uh, it's a very good environment for everyone to enjoy. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Um, that's all we have time for today. So I just want to take a moment and say thank you to to all of the speakers. It's I feel that like we could continue for a, for a while, but uh, I think we have to draw a line here. But uh, really, really fascinated to um, to hear from you all, and also to sort of uh, find out about this incredible exhibition um, for any of our audience based in Beijing that haven't seen it yet. I think there's still a small amount, very small amount of time. Um, otherwise, thank you very much, and yeah, goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.